So, this is the first word that came to me this morning, that God's judgments has come for the nations. God will judge the nations. First Chronicles chapter 16 verse 14. All nations and every nation sins, they are coming up to God, coming up before him in its order of intensity. How great are the cries. You know, if you have wireless internet, there's a small little icon on your laptop that shows the number of the bars of the strength of the signal. Am I right? When you have the greatest strength, it shows four bars or five bars. And depending on the strength and the weakness of the signal, the bars get reduced. Sometimes when the signal is so weak, it shows you a yellow flag. Right? Means too weak, about to go off. So, depending the number of bars, it shows the strength. In the same manner, according to this intensity, the greatness of the sins of a nation, it reaches out to God first. It goes out to God first. So, whose cries are the greatest? They reach heaven first. Let me give you a very good example. The Bible tells us that the earth cries out to God. If you read Isaiah chapter 24, verses 4 and 5, chapter 33, verse 9, and Romans chapter 8, verse 22, it says that the earth is groaning, the earth is mourning, the earth is groaning in pain. It's crying out to God, God, I cannot take it anymore. All the nations of the earth, every nation is crying out to God. God, we cannot take it anymore. We cannot take it anymore. When the sins of the land are great. Now, let me tell you one thing. If you read 1 Kings chapter 18, there were two runners running in a race. One was King Ahab on a chariot. The other was Elijah. And Elijah told Ahab, after three years it's going to rain. A torrential rain. Cats and dogs are going to rain down from the skies. I don't know where they get that saying from, you know. Do you? See, it's raining cats and dogs. So far, I've never seen any. Have you? Anyway. Oh, thank God. Anyway. So, Elijah told him, it's going to rain. A torrential rain is going to come. And you don't even have an umbrella, Ahab. You don't have an umbrella. You don't have an overcoat. So, you better get on your chariot and drive as fast as you could so that you reach the palace before a single drop of rain touches you. So King Ahab knew that he should believe and trust Elijah's words because he just saw Elijah slaughtering 850 false prophets. If Ahab did not listen, he would have been the 851st person. So he better obey. So he mounted up on his chariot, driven by two fast horses, and as he was driving past by, zoom, faster than a speeding bullet, faster than a bird. Who's that? Not Superman. <laughs> Elijah. You know, I made a little research. Horses can run 60 miles per hour. That's how fast a horse can run. An average horse. So, a chariot is pulled by two horses. Now, two horses running at 60 miles per hour, that's a lot of horsepower. Don't you agree? Now, let's look at the weight of a chariot. I do not know how heavy a chariot is. Let's suppose it's 100 pounds. 
Okay. And then A hab. Uh, A hab, how many pounds would it be? 100? Okay, not 200. Not that, not that fat, you know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, should I say big? A fat is a fat, you know. Anyway, okay, big. So 100 pounds, uh, okay, 120 pounds, okay? 120 pounds plus a 100 pounds, that's 200 pound weight of drag. And 60 miles per hour horses pulling a drag, so their speed can be lowered to, let's say, 40 or 50. Okay, I'm not a mathematician. We are just playing Jeopardy game. <laughs> okay, we are making some lucky guesses. Now, statistics tell us, or the Guinness Book of Records tell us, the fastest man that can run is a maximum of 20 miles per hour. That's how a, the fastest man can run, 20 miles per hour. So, Let's suppose Hussein Bolt. You know Hussein Bolt? Okay, he's the fastest sprinter on planet Earth. Say, okay, Carl Lewis. You know Carl Lewis? Okay, we'll forget about Hussein Bolt. He's not American. Let's bring Carl Lewis, full blooded American. I'm into lots of sports, you know. So, Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis is running on a race with the horses. And by the time Carl Lewis takes a few steps, the chariot would have gone many, many hundreds of feet. Agreed, everybody? So the fastest man is no match because he can run at 20 miles per hour, and the horses are running at least about 40 miles per hour. But here comes Elijah, who outran the horses, which means Elijah must have run more than 60 miles per hour. Agreed, everybody? Which is humanly impossible. It is humanly impossible, and if you achieve it, then it is supernatural. Right? Now, this is something that God has reserved for the last day's church to pour out the powers of the age to come. And when these powers of the age to come is poured out on the last day's remnant church, whatever feats and miraculous works that you read in the Bible will all look like child's play. This was the revelation the Lord gave me when I was in Louisiana in 2008, when I was visited by four angels who were the chief angels of the state of Louisiana. And the chief among them spoke to me and he said, God wants you to speak on the powers of the age to come in this conference. You know, except for the, the phrase powers of the age to come that you read in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, I don't know anything about that subject. So for the next two hours, the angels taught me what it means to have the powers of the age to come. And among the many things, after explaining all that, he told me in one summarized sentence, whatever the miracles that you read in the Bible will all appear like child's play when the powers of the age to come is poured out. And he made a startling sentence that blew my mind off. He said, even the angels in heaven have not seen such a move of the Holy Spirit yet. That really blew me, you know. The first part when he says the, the miracles in the Bible will appear child's play did not shake me. But when he said, the angels in heaven have not seen such a move of the Holy Spirit yet that really blew my mind off because they have seen the work of the Holy Spirit from creation. When the Holy Spirit brewed on the waters over the earth 
and it recreated earth from chaos, the angels have been watching. Right? They've been watching how the Holy Spirit did all that work. God spoke and the Holy Spirit made it come to pass. The entire creation in the whole wide universe, all the galaxies that we admire, they were all done by the Holy Spirit. And the angel said, we have not seen yet the great and awesome things the Holy Spirit is going to do when the powers of the age to come anointing is poured out upon the last day's remnant church. Now let's come back to Ahab and Elijah. Those two men represent two people group. Ahab represents the wicked and the sinners in the land. And Elijah represents the praying people, the intercessors, those who will take hold of God and pray. Now please listen. Which, whichever touches the finishing line, that will come upon the nation. If the sin touches the finishing line first, or let's put it the other way, if the sin reaches God's throne first, then it will open the floodgates of judgment. But if the cries of God's people reach heaven first, see two kind of cries, cries from the land and cries from the church. But if the cries from the church, the true church, we're not just talking about the so-called church. There are two kinds of churches today, no? The bride of Christ and the bride of the devil. Right? There are two kinds of bride. So, when the true church cry reaches heaven, instead of judgment, mercy and righteousness will reign upon a nation. See, that is the purpose God reveals all this. Before judgment, mercy. Amen. So the cries of the nation reaches God. In Genesis chapter 18, we read of an encounter between God, two angels and Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 18 verse 20, God tells Abraham, the cries of Sodom and Gomorrah have reached my ears. They have reached my ears and I have come down to see for myself the intensity, the gravity of the cries that I have heard. He came down. The Bible tells us, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah was not only destroyed because they were a nation of gays and lesbians. So not only that, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 13 verse 13, they were a greatly wicked people. If you look at the gays in your society today, they are fashionable people, right? They are like upmarket people. You have senators who are gays, am I right? You have judges who are gays. You have your lawmakers who are gays. Now, they all don't look like wicked people. They all are nice people. Right? Very nicely dressed. All sitting in high offices. You will never ever imagine the rulers of the land are gays unless and until they open their mouth and identify themselves. Now you have a string of Hollywood celebrities who are openly and claiming that they are gays. Look at them, all fashionable celebrities, right? And even sports celebrities, sports stars, they are openly claiming it's no more shameful thing. No more shameful thing. 
Rather, it has become a fashionable statement. I'm a gay. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed not because they were all gays. The Bible says they were extremely wicked people. Secondly, in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 to 50 says, that there was gross wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a lot of wealth in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were not giving to the poor. Lot of wealth. They have too much of wealth, they need not work. So they were a nation of idle people. Idle, they were just idling around. And there was so much of food that they were throwing and wasting. You know, just uh, a couple of months ago, I read in an article, one of the richest billionaires in India, this is a true story, went to Hamburg in Germany. So they were trying to make some business contacts, you know. So they found a German company and they were trying to tie up some business deals. And after their business talk, they went out for lunch. And they went to a restaurant, which was not populated. Not much people were there. So they thought maybe because most of the people are poor. So there were very, very few people, German people, eating in the restaurant. And they glanced to their right, there were two old women that were sitting in a corner eating very little food. So they thought there must be these poor people, they didn't have much money, and they're just eating little food. And these were uh, Two Indians and uh, two Germans, they ordered huge, sumptuous, many, many dishes. And they add, and they add, and they add. When you have too much of food, there's so much only you can eat, right? There is no expander inside to expand it, you know, right? It's only a limited capacity. So, about half of all the food they ordered were uneaten and they called for the check. Now these two women, old women, who were just minding their own business and eating food, just looked at over, glanced at their table, came over to them and scolded them for wasting all this food. She rent, rentled them in her heavily accented Texan German. And those, uh, those uh, Indians and the Hamburgans looked at her and she said, woman, what is that to you? It's our money. We are paying for it. Whether we eat or we don't eat, we are paying for it. What's your problem? She looked at them, you know, small little German woman with a cure look in her eyes, like a hawkish look on her eyes, she pulled out her cell phone, she called the police. And the police came. Within minutes, the police came and fined these men for wasting food. So those men, they protested. They said, no, what, what's your problem? It's our money and we are paying for it. So the policeman said, here in this city, we don't waste our food resources. Eat what you can. It's your money. But the food is our food. Our resources. Don't waste. Eat what you can. Order what you can. Don't waste the food. Because what you waste is waste, right? Nobody can eat that. Nobody wants to eat that. Am I right, everybody? But Sodom and Gomorrah was like that. Too much of food. And they were great wasters. Gross sins. Great wickedness. It's just not just their flirtatious lifestyle, but all kinds of sins that compounded that God decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Some nations don't want to repent. 
even when they are worn. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 7 to 9, they don't want to repent. It's inside them. They don't want to repent. Let me give you an example. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, Jonah went to Nineveh and he preached for three days, walking from the west to the east, from one end of the nation to another end of the nation, three days walking journey. And he cried with just one message. In 40 days, this nation will be destroyed. Just one sentence. From one end to another end, he kept on repeating his message. In 40 days, this city will be destroyed. And the Bible tells us that when the king heard it, he repented. And they all cried out to God, hoping. You know, this is a unrighteous king who said, let's all cry out to God. He's not a Christian king. This king doesn't know the true God. But as soon as he heard the word from a prophet, this prophet is not a Ninevite. He came from Israel. So he's a foreigner. So the king heard the word of a foreigner and he humbled himself, put away his royal robes, put on sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he said, who knows if this God will not have mercy on us. Who knows? Let's all humble ourselves. Whether he will destroy us or whether he will have mercy on us, we don't know. Let's take a gamble. Let's humble ourselves. Who knows? If he can be moved, who knows? For such a time as this. Who knows? If he looks at our humbling and he's moved with compassion, moved with mercy, let's take our chances. What do we stand to lose? Let's do it. A whole nation from the sucking baby right up to the king. Even the cats, the dogs, the mouse, everybody fasted. Everybody fasted. Entire nation. Can you imagine President Obama sitting in sackcloth and ashes? Your nation will become a holy nation. Right? whole nation fasted and prayed and because of that God's mercy was given to them instead of destruction but it only lasted for 100 years and eventually Nineveh was destroyed according to the prophecy of Jonah it was destroyed because they won't stay repented they don't want to change for righteousness there are some people, some nations who don't want to repent even when they are warned. God in his great mercy warns us, but we don't want to repent. Those nations' cup becomes full and overflow. See, when you don't want to repent, what happens? Your cup run becomes full and it begins to overflow. Joel chapter 3 verse 13. When it begins to get full and overflow, there's still mercy, you know, when it reaches the brim. There's still mercy because it hasn't overflowed yet. God's judgment comes when it begins to overflow. But till even when it reaches the brim, God still waits because there's still time for you to repent and turn back. It's the goodness of God, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That is why he waits patiently even for a thousand years. That's what the Bible says. A thousand years to us is just a day to God. To him, it seems that he's waiting for a day. 
But to us, it seems that it's a thousand days. Why? Thousand years. Because he's not willing that any perish. All should come to repentance. He's not willing. He's waiting, waiting and waiting. And when the cup is full of sins, abominations, filthiness and fornication, then it spills over. When that happens, what is the sign that the cup is full and is about to overflow? Bright blossoms. That, that is the first sign you can see. People or a nation or a church or a minister or a ministry becomes very arrogantly prideful. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 10. Bright blossoms. Look at Lucifer's life. If you read Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 15 to 17. The Bible says, you were perfect in all your ways till iniquity was found in you. He was perfect from the day Lucifer was created till iniquity was found. He was perfect. There was no sin, nothing in him. He was a perfect angel, the chiefest among all angels in heaven. But when iniquity was found, it has bluesome inside him. Pride has bluesome. That is why you read in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. He says, I will ascend my throne above the Most High God. Five times he said, I, I, I. And you know, five stands for grace. He lost the grace when he allowed pride to bruise inside him. You try to imagine now, how can a created angel equal with God? How is it possible? God is uncreated. Light. He dwells in unapproachable light. So if God dwells in unapproachable light where no one can approach him, how dare did Lucifer ever thought that he can be equal with God or even worship God? That's deception. When you open your heart to pride, deception creeps in and makes you think there is none equal to you. You are the one and only. That's pure deception. Any nation, any church, any minister, any ministry that ever thinks they are the one, it is a sign that pride has bluesome. But till they don't say that, there's still room. See, a good example is Nebuchadnezzar. Say, my great Babylon, pride bluesome. And immediately he was judged. And God judged. He judges the nations. When the cup becomes full. And when pride blossoms, what is the accompanying works in a nation? Wickedness and violence increases. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 11. Wickedness and violence increases in the land. Just two weeks ago, or, or ten days ago, a teenage boy, or just twenty-something, walked into a black church in Charleston, South Carolina, and gunned down nine parishioners. Now, what is that? Wickedness of an unimaginable scale, right? Little, little kids, even little children walking into school with a gun in their hands. Right? This, it doesn't only take place in the US, no? it also takes place in India. 
one of our ministry's partner. This happened a few, about two years ago. Our ministry's partner, a wonderful Christian who does good Christian ministry, she was teaching and she reprimanded a student. That was the end of it. Lunch break, this lady was sitting at her table and marking the books. And the student was reprimanded, came and stabbed her a few times and killed her on the spot. This shocked the nation because such things have never taken place before. In my home state and in the very city where I live, we have never ever heard such things before. But you see, I, we should thank you, you know for exporting all your Hollywood movies. <laughs> See, what is Hollywood teaching today? Gun violence, right? Any kind of movies you watch today, there is filled, spice with violence. So people who are watching such movies, what's going inside them? Take a gun, get a gun, go and shoot around. Psychos, right? Psychos walking everywhere, shooting everyone. Violence and wickedness increases in the land. And when that happens, what is the next result? They sin openly for all to see. Ezekiel 21 verse 24. They are no more ashamed of their sins. Now yesterday, The U.S. Supreme Court passed an unimaginable law. Now the whole nation of the U.S. has passed the same-sex marriage bill. You know, let me tell you one thing. Two days ago, I was, uh, not two days ago, last week I was in Costa Mesa in California to speak at a Chinese church conference. And there, I had a visitation from the Lord Jesus. And the Lord, you know, my room faces the city. And there's a nice, huge window, huge sliding doors. And I was meditating the scriptures, and the Lord Jesus appeared before me. And he stood by the glass window, and he's looking into the city. And he said, come and stand with me. So I came and stood beside the Lord. And he was just looking at the city. And he said, this city is going to be destroyed. I was shocked. I, I said, why, Lord? He said, these people are worse than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And I was shocked. And there were many other things. Maybe in the other few sessions, I will share that with you. Yesterday, we were at the Los Angeles airport, standing in queue to board the flight to Houston. And as I was standing there, I felt a strange sensation of the presence of God around me. And I turned to my right and I saw an angel stand beside me. And he said, again he said, this city will be destroyed with a massive earthquake. And when he said that, I looked, I looked up. Now who was speaking to me? And I saw this angel was so huge and mighty that his top reaches the cloud. That was how huge he was. And he had a long, huge sledge hammer in his hand. And he said, I'm going to strike this place. Now, on the flight from Los Angeles to Houston, I was pondering in my heart, something is wrong. Why? In just a few days apart, I would get a revelation like this, the same thing repeated twice. Why? I was pondering that, you know. 
till this morning, I was pondering within me. In the past, I had many, many words for U.S., but not given to me in such a succession, in such a short time, the same thing repeated two times. I was wondering why, until this morning, when I opened my email, and there I received this news. Same-sex marriage bill passed by the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court is like the gatekeeper of your nation, right? So, the highest legal authority in the nation passed a bill. They made a decision and they opened the floodgates of the nation. See, they opened the floodgates of the nation. The Supreme Court are the judges of the land, right? Like the judges. A judge is like the king. Now, they opened the floodgates of the land for an avalanche of demonic spirits to invade the nation. Then I understood, you know, why the Lord told me in Costa Mesa that this nation is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. More wicked and worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Even now, as I'm speaking to you, I'm, I'm shaking inside me, you know. This is not good. Every time, when God tells me something like this, I fall on my knees, and I hold on to him, and I cry out to him, Lord, what about your remnant people? What about your remnant people? And in Costa Mesa, I asked the Lord the same question. Lord, what about your people? There are the righteous people there. The remnant is there. We cannot deny the fact that the large majority are wicked. But what about the righteous people? Like Abraham interceded, no? I cried out to God. I said, Lord, what about them? And the Lord told me, they will be protected. At the right time, I will send my angels and ask them to flee from this place. You know, this is my second visit to Houston. I first came to Houston in 2003 to speak at, for a small Chinese church. All the Baptist churches in Houston, the Chinese churches, they all gathered together and we did a conference for them. That was in 2003. So this is the second time that I'm coming in over a decade. So I, the only thing I know about Houston is NASA. Because when I was small, I wanted to be an astronaut. So I read all about NASA. But that ambition did not come to pass in the natural. But it was fulfilled in the spirit. <laughs> anyway, so the only thing that I know about Houston is NASA. Everybody knows that, right? Yesterday, when I step out from the airplane.